here. Welcome. Super appreciate you coming to learn all about the history of the SM7B and the SM5 and SM7 and all of those wonderful microphones. Um, just a little house cleaning um, up front. If you have any questions or anything, you can either use the chat box or the Q&A box um, and we'll answer questions as we go. Um, and thank you to Excellence Marketing for presenting this alongside Sure. Um, I'm going to introduce Ken Simons here, the CEO and President of Excellence Marketing, and he'll give you a little intro of Michael as well because they are very longtime friends. So I will well, I don't pass know it to you, Ken. We, we've known each other a long time. You have to ask him <laughs> if we're friends. Yeah, we, Fair we, enough. We, we put up with each other. It's both that way. When I started at Sure in 1980, Michael was my big brother there that showed me the ropes in the sales department. So you've been there. You were there four years before I was. So you got mm. there in 1976. Yep. So 45 years in the saddle. Yep. And he's got the best job in the world. He's, yeah, I uh, do indeed. Don't tell anybody, Ken. <laughs> no, I want that one, damn it. So you get to pretty much do do what you want to do as far as finding and creating the history of, of the company and understanding what's out there. Yeah. Um, uh, my, 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 my entire title job title is their job description is own sure history and build roads to it. That's it. So however many ways I can do that, like this, like it's great fun. Well, let's have you kick it off. Okay. Um, and I will. We will be answering chat questions in the background, cool. and any questions that pop in. All right. So just make sure everybody can see the opening screen. Is that correct? History of the Sure yes. SM7. Great. Winner. Let's go. Let's go on then. So it's been fifty-seven years now that the SM5 and the SM7 have been popular for voiceover work. You know, TV, radio, podcasting now. Uh, but a lot of people don't know they employ the Unidyne 3 mic element, which came out in 1959. So a way to look at this is the 5 and the 7 are kind of the grandchildren of the Unidyne 1. So I'd like to kind of briefly explore the ancestry before we get into the 5 and the 7. 1939, March 1939, here is our sure Unidyne 1 Model 55, the grandparent, if you will, of the 5 and the 7. And what was important about this microphone, it was the world's first unidirectional moving coil dynamic microphone with only a single capsule. That was a big deal. You could make a cardioid microphone before this, but it required a bi-directional capsule and an omnidirectional capsule. And we've worked out a way to do it with a single capsule. When it came out in 1939, it was 45 bucks, which was $835 in 2021. So it was not cheap, but everybody recognizes the Elvis mic, the birdcage mic, whatever you want to call it. Guy worked for us named Benjamin Bauer, <clears throat> and he invented the Uniphase Acoustical Network. Basically, that's the acoustical paths and labyrinths in the microphone that make it directional. And he did this in 1937 when he was only 24 years old. That's what's really amazing to me. So here's Ben. This is around 1945. Uh, he was the inventor of it. And in 2014, IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, identified that microphone as a key invention of the 20th century. And so we were presented a milestone award in 2014. Other milestone awards included the work of Nikola Tesla, the Apollo 11 project, the invention of the internet, um, a lot of other things. So to have that as an award is a pretty cool thing. Here's a photograph of Ben, by the way, in Shure headquarters, downtown Chicago in 1945. 1937, November 19th. This is a page from his lab notebook. Yes, we have his handwritten lab notebooks. They are locked up in my office. And this is the first day where he described the Uniphase Acoustical Network concept, which is this thing right here, which has never changed and is still used the same today. I just love the sentence up on top. The following arrangement seems to offer possibilities. Yes, indeed. If there's an understatement for the ages, that's it. Uh, also notice it was for a crystal microphone. He didn't envision the moving coil until a little bit later. So here's what his first unidirectional Unidyne prototype looked like in 1937. Doesn't look like much. It didn't even have a magnetic field to it. You had to take a horseshoe magnet and stick it to the bottom of it to make it operate. We have all of his prototypes in the Sure archives. So we went from this industrial design prototype, which is what it's going to look like in 1938. This is a piece of carved wood. That's the original looking of, look of the microphone to the final version in a couple of years. August 1941, we got a patent on it. Here's the one page of the patent. This here, 
down there. And it's the same thing that was hand drawn on that first page of the notebook that I showed you. Some of you may notice that the name is Baumswiger. <clears throat> he was born with that name in the Ukraine. And he changed it to the Bauer around 1941, which of course is the first three letters B-A-U and the last letters E-R. At the time, Sure was doing a lot of work for the military and we did even more work as World War II got on. Every time the military people came to Sure to visit it, they would meet Ben Baumswiger and they would say in a very suspicious voice, Baumswiger, is that German? So he got tired of that and basically changed it to Bauer to get rid of that. So we sold a larger version, the Unidyne 1 from 1939 to 1951. And in 1951, we introduced the Unidyne 2, which is slightly, slightly smaller. S simply meant stands for small. And this is the size that we make today. It's about 66% the size of the Unidyne 1. And we brought this out because it was considered too large for television, which was getting popular. The Unidyne 1 hid too much of the face. Elvis, of course, was so associated with the Unidyne microphone that some people still refer to it as the Elvis microphone. When I go on eBay looking at, at these, they're called the uh, uh, Fat Boys, which ne we never call them that, or the Elvis microphone, or the Birdcage microphone. They have lots of different nicknames. So 20 years after we brought out the Unidyne 1, we bring out the Unidyne 3. This is introduced in 1959. Uh, it was advertised then as the world's smallest cardioid dynamic microphone. That was probably true at the time. Uh, it had a net price of $50, and this is the motor, if you will, that's inside the SM7B. Also, for you microphone geeks, note the connector. It is an Amphenol screw-on connector rather than an XLR connector. The Beatles were early adopters of the 545. Um, they were doing large concerts. They needed to be louder than other bands, of course, and it turned out that the Unidyne 3 was really good at game before feedback. Here's a photo of the... Um, Beatles in sure, uh, excuse me, in Chicago at Comiskey Park in August 1965. Ken, you weren't there by any chance, were you? No, that's too bad. I think. Oh, but uh, no kidding. Yeah, but uh, sure had loaned them 12 microphones, 545s for the tours, and there they are with those 545s, and the windscreen held on with a rubber band. How sophisticated! Who developed the Unidyne 3? Well, is this gentleman here? His name Ernie Sealer. Uh, Ernie came to work at Shure in 1953, retired in 1997. He was a protege of Bauer. And his, also like Bauer, who had a hit right out of the, you know, out of, as his first product, Ernie had his hit with the Unidyne 3. And that was our first unidirectional microphone where you talked into the end of the microphone rather into the side of the microphone. So it's an end fire microphone rather than the side fire. But there's another unsung hero, a guy named Bob Carr. Bob came up with the idea of making a new line of microphones that was designed for radio and television and film studios. Some people think the SM and Sure SM microphones stand for Sure microphones. It does not. It stands for studio microphone. And Bob came up with the idea of taking existing Sure products and putting a dark, non-reflective finish on them, putting on the XLR connector because the XLR connector was preferred by studios over the Amphenol, wire them as balanced low impedance, and have no on-off switches on them. And we came up with a line of SM microphones. SM5 was one of the very first ones. We'll talk about this as well. But also, in this photo, I want you to look at this microphone in the back here. That is an SM3 ribbon microphone that sure made about 10 prototypes of but never brought out. And uh, we have a couple of them in the archive, and they were designed to compete with the RCA ribbon microphones at, at the time. RCA ribbon mics were very popular. So it's 1964, using the Unidyne 3 motor, we bring out the SM5 studio microphone. It was designed for overhead boom use in film and television. And there was two versions, a 50 ohm version and a 150 ohm version. It cost $225, translated to 2021, that's $1,860. So it was not a cheap mic. Here's the first ad for the SM5. Notice the boom microphone ignores everything except the dialogue. So when Bob Carr was calling on broadcasters and on film studios, they said, well, you know, if you're going to compete, you got to have a boom microphone. And most boom microphones were then and still are condenser mics. We didn't have condenser technology back then. Sure didn't have their own condenser. So we took the Unidyne 3 and tried to make it into the best boom microphone that we could. It worked pretty good, except with a dynamic microphone, very low output level, and that's eventually what killed it as far as a boom microphone goes. 
So what happens when your first units fail, your A and your B, you bring out a third one. And we brought out the SM5C, which is a variation of the SM5A. The only difference was it had a 100 hertz, 100 hertz high pass filter in it. And that was to get rid of low frequency rumble as the microphone got whipped back and forth by the boom operator. But here's a uh, disassembled version of the SM5. And if you look at the mic element in there, and if you've ever taken an SM57 apart, you notice oh, there's some similarities there. So 1970, six years after introduction, SM5 is selling poorly. Doesn't work very well as, a, as an overhead boom because it's at a low output level. And being a dynamic microphone, the only way you can increase the output level is by making a, increasing the strength of the permanent magnet or changing the length of the voice coil. Both of those would have been a major engineering effort. And so even if the sales had doubled, doing an SM5D, which we never did, didn't seem to make any sense. But interestingly enough, if you take the SM5 and you close talked it, it actually sounded pretty good for on-air microphone and radio studios. Now, sure, it wasn't hip to this, but there were radio studios that were, and this SM5 started to get a little following as a superb radio for DJ microphones, on-air microphones. However, unbeknownst to folks, far fewer were sold than the outside world ever imagined. There are some radio broadcasters that just berated sure for decades that we got rid of the SM5. But my question to you is, and, and anybody can answer this, uh, I'm going to ask Ken for certainly, how many SM5s do you think we sold in the best year ever of it? That would be the SM5 and the SM5B and the SM5C all added up in the best year. How many do you think we sold? Ken, take a, take a look, take a, take a chance. I was going to say a thousand. It's not okay. the type of product. A, a, a thousand. All right. That's a pretty good guess. Anybody else have any guesses coming in? And if not, I'll just change the screen. And you, you can just tell yourself if you want. So Bruce says 50. Kelly says 22. <laughs> 22. I love that. <clears throat> well, interestingly enough, <clears throat> we sold about one a day or about 250 units a year. Why such a small number? <clears throat> well, radio stations were the primary customers, and radio stations, they take good care of microphones. So they didn't wear out, and they simply didn't need new ones. They replaced the foam windscreens, and that's all they needed to do. So this is probably, I've asked radio, radio people who really love the SM5, oh, you guys must have sold thousands and thousands of these every year. Well, 250 is not thousands, and that's a fairly poor selling microphone. So... The SM5 was on the market for 24 years and was discontinued around 1988. But now let's go back to 1969. Even in 1969, we knew the 5 was expensive. The manufacturer sold poorly, and some customers felt it was so large, too large. So we started a project to make a smaller, lower-cost model, which became the SM7. It really wasn't too hard to do because we already had the mic element. That was a variation on the SM57 element, a Unidyne 3. We already had the isolation mount, which is a variation on our A55M, a rubber-filled donut. The yoke was a variation on the SM5 yoke. And the only thing really new was the industrial design. So in the late <clears throat> 1972, we bring out the SM7. Introduced in late 1972, first sold in 1973. Interesting enough, look at the user net price, $256.80. I think they're like $4.99 now. So it really hasn't gone up a lot in 50 years. We were aiming for the voiceover market, radio, TV, recording studios for the primary markets. We did not stress this for overhead boom use. The features that are in the SM7 are the same as they are today. We have the two switches, which tailor the frequency response. We've got the air suspension mount. They have the integrated pop filter and the uniform cardioid pattern. Not cardioid pattern. Those things have not changed. Here's what the SM7 the mic element looked like when we first came out. And again, it's a 57 variation. You've got this large acoustical chamber here, which extends a low end. That's why you get that uh, voiceover, mic, voiceover announcer type of sound. Here's the air suspension mount. That's the rubber-filled donuts like our A55M. It had a pump pumping coil on it. And the front of it actually was an SM57 resonator. If you've looked at the 57, imagine that grill on the 57 that just sawed in half and it gave you what that was on the front of it. So it really is a close cousin to a 57 element. Here's a guy that Ken remembers, and I remember well, of course, Jerry Pleiss. He was a microphone development engineer. In fact, he invented the rubber donut shock mount that sure has. And 
interestingly enough, he designed one and only one product as far as how it looked, and that's the SM7. Generally, Jerry worked at the motors, went out inside the microphones. He didn't work on the outer appearance of it, but this one he did. And here's the patent that he got in 1974 for the design patent of the SM7. For those of you who don't follow patents, there are two types. A utility patent <clears throat> covers the way a product works, and a design patent covers how it looks. So this is a design patent. This is the appearance of the SM7. Of course, it just says microphone because that's what it was. So this protected the outer appearance of it. It did not connect the, connect the or protect the inner appearance because that was already covered because we had the Unidyne 3 patent. So for 26 years, the SM7 basically remained unchanged from 1972 up until 1999 when we changed one thing. We had to make the humbucking coil better. Radio stations had started putting CRT monitors close to the DJs. They had a fairly strong magnetic field, and that would cause hum and buzz if the microphone got close to it. So we had to improve the humbucking coil. We also changed the mic mount <clears throat> on the SM7, and that was the SM7A. And then two years later, we decided to bring out a foam windscreen that looked very much like the SM5. We figured that maybe some people, if we made the SM7 look like the SM5, they would buy it. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. So that windscreen, though it does give you better pop protection, was primarily brought out to make it look more like the SM5 for the people who were complaining that we discontinued the SM5. So the SM7B has stayed the same since 2001. From 1973 to 2008, our sales were relatively stable. It was an average selling microphone. It's like a guy on a ball team who hits singles all the time. You know, you don't want to trade him because he's pretty good, but he's not really a huge home run hitter or a star, but he's not bad enough to get rid of. So we just basically kept it around for 35 years. And then 35 years, and then around 2008, podcasters started to discover this microphone and they started to tell other podcasters about it. And then around 2015, gamers started to talk about people. Here it is now, 2021, this microphone is going to be 50 years old in 2023, and the sales are 100 times greater, 100 times greater than they were 20 years ago. It's just astonishing. You cannot believe what we've had to do to expand production line, expand the number of people, just to keep up with the demand of the SM7B. In fact, the year 2020 was the best SM7 sales year ever, even though that product was brought out in 1972. So... Here's some fun things, this notable uses of the SM7. So I, now I also, believe it or not, I work for the legal department of sure. That should scare you, if nothing else. So I have to say this. Images are for educational purposes only and do not imply an endorsement of sure or its products. But these are people using our products. Let's look on TV first. For those of you old enough to remember this show, it was called Northern Exposure, early 1990s on CBS. Uh, took place in a small Alaskan town, and they had a radio station, and the DJ had an SM7, which they took the windscreen off of. I have no idea why. I guess because it made it look funky. But I happen to like this photo because if you look really closely here, that's not an XLR connector. They just took a cable with a 3.5 millimeter <laughs> connector and just shoved it in there to make it look like there was a cable. So obviously, that wasn't the audio you were hearing uh, on the program itself. There's a current program on Netflix called Dear White People. It takes places in recording studios and also in a radio station. SM7 is seen widely on that. A uh, very popular DJ in the 60s and 70s named Wolfman Jack. Here he is in WNBC in New York City using his SM7. Uh, Howard Stern on Sirius XM. His uh, sidekick is Robin Quivers. Here she is with an SM7 with a larger windscreen. And the SM7 on the radio is also NPR. They have a show called called 1A, and this is a shot. Uh, actually, it's their promo shot, but they do use the SM7s for all their on-air as well. In the recording studio, it's fairly well known that Michael Jackson recorded his Thriller album with an SM7. Uh, the one thing that's not standard there is this is not a standard foam windscreen that sure made. It was actually a Neumann pop filter that they froze and carved out the middle of it so it would fit on the SM7. And this is something that we found out only fairly recently. Um, the Stones have used the SM7 on Mick Jagger for most of the recordings starting back in the 70s. Now, here he is. You can see there's a condenser mic in front of him. It's a Neumann, I believe. 
and a Shure SM7. So when he's recording, they actually record a track of condenser and a con track of dynamic, the SM7. And then during the mix down, they choose which track sounds the best. I have been told by several folks that work with the Stones that most of the time it's the SM7 seems to fit Jagger's voice real well. And here's Willie Nelson doing a streaming concert. Uh, this is about three months old now from his uh, studio in his house or somewhere near his house. And he had all SM7s there as well. Podcasting. Thank you, Ken, for this photo. This just came out yesterday. Bruce Springsteen on the left, uh, Barack Obama on the right. And they are doing a podcast called Renegades Born in the USA, and they are using two SM7s. This photograph is fairly new. I think it was just in the New York Times yesterday. Anna Ferris, an actress, does a podcast called Unqualified. Here she is with her SM7. And here's uh, Mark Marone with his WTF podcast, also with Barack Obama a few years ago. And you can see there's one, two, three SM7s there being used for that podcast. They're also used for streaming. This is Apple, uh, for a press event that they did uh, last August. And they've got the Apple wireless earphones here, but they have a Shure SM7, which if you blow it up, this photo up here, they took a piece of tape and put it across our logo here. Thank you very much, Apple. I didn't know you were that insecure. Uh, but I do want to have a note to Apple that I want you to know that uh, this SM7 that you're using still uses the original operating system that we put in it in 1972. That's never been the need to be upgraded. So maybe you should learn something about that with your products. Excuse me. I just had to say that. Anyway, let's finish this up with some uh, John Cleese stuff, some interesting questions I get asked about the SM7 and not if it's a dead parrot or not. So what does Eudonine mean? That term was first used by Schur in 1939. It has multiple meanings. Uni means a single element microphone. It also means a directional pattern. Dyne means a dynamic mic element, and dyne is also a force used in acoustics. So the term uni and dime was put together and was sure was granted a trademark for it in July 1960. And it is still an active trademark for us. What's the origin of the SM7 model number? It's simply a sequence. We brought out that SM3 ribbon microphone that I showed you before, and we had a 5, and then we had a 7. We did use SM1 and SM2 back in the 1980s. They were on-air headsets. We've never used four, six, eight, or nine. Uh, we may use them in the future, but there are current mics called a KSM-8 and a KSM-9, which are fairly close to that. So it's something, you know, no, nothing magic about that number. It just happened to be the sequence that we used. Do the 57 and the SM-7 use the same mic element? I would say they are very close cousins, but not exactly the same. The SM-7 diaphragm is the same size and shape as the 57, but it's not as thick and it's more compliant. It's more flexible. The seven voice coil has thinner wire and has about three times as many turns as the SM57 voice coil. That's to make up because the SM7 does not have an output transformer. And the original SM7 resonator, as I mentioned before, was the SM57 grill sawn in half. So this is what a 57 grill looks like. And we would take the front half and just saw it off. And that would be the resonator on the front of the SM7. Today, the SM7B has its own custom molded resonator. But to get going, that was just an expedient way to do it. Use the SM57 grill as a resonator. Was the 57 covered by a patent or the SM7 covered by a patent? It was covered by a design patent, but the utility patent was for the SM, excuse me, for the Unidyne 3. And that covered all the microphones with the Unidyne 3. This simplified acoustical analog drawing here, it is the same as you saw on that Ben Bauer notebook page at the beginning of the presentation. And of course, Ernie Seeler was the inventor. This patent expired in 1983. The origins of the SM7 switches, they just didn't come out of nowhere. Sure, at the time in 1969, it introduced six inline audio adapters. We still have some of them there, by the way. They're called the A15 series of problem solvers. And one of them was an A15HP high pass, which reduced the bass filters. Another one was called an A15RS, a response shaper, which reduced the treble frequencies. And so we simply took the circuits out of those A15 problem solvers, stuck them in the back of the SM7, put some switches on there, and that's where those different curves come from by putting the A15, the equivalent of the A15HP and A15RS into the back of the SM7. Uh, some other trivia. Uh, the original SM5 had a two dark gray windscreen and a light gray windscreen. This dark and light 
was inspired by the original two-tone finish of an SM57 or of an SM mic handle. Uh, I think Ken actually has a really old SM7, and if we look at it closely later, you'll see that there is a lighter gray base pattern, and then on top of that are like darker gray specks. We don't do that anymore, but that's what was done originally with the paint finish. Uh, the five element and the seven element are set back from the leading edge of the foam. That's to reduce P popping. Neither mic, the five or the seven, has an output transformer. That was to reduce hum pickup when they were used uh, near lighting or other devices. And uh, as I mentioned before, the 73, in 1973, the SM7 came out at a price of $257. Now the user net is $499. If it had kept pace with inflation, the SM7B would now be $1,485 if it had if, you know, so it's a, it's a bargain. And the newly introduced MV7 is named after the SM7. And I'm sure you're all shocked about that. So here's the MV7. I'm just going to mention this straight because it's what I'm using now at the moment. Uh, it came out in October 2020, user price of $249. It is the great grandchild of that Unidyne Model 55. It's got a dynamic mic element in it. It's not a Unidyne 3 element. It's a, it's a cousin of the Unidyne 3 element cardioid pattern, USB output. It also has a balanced mic level XLR analog output, which you can use at the same time, which is a pretty cool feature. I used that not too long ago where I was doing an interview uh, with the equivalent of NPR in Brit Britain. Uh, it was a BBC thing. And we used the USB output so I could talk to the interviewer who was in the UK, but then I used the XLR output to use a uh, local uh, sound devices recorder that I had to record a WAV file locally. And then I sent that to them and they put them together to make it sound like we were in the same room. Mute button, headphone level control, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and a free app on it that you can use if you want to, which has EQ, limiting, compression, audio, auto leveling, and so forth. I've never used that. I just basically plugged it in and the way it goes and it sounds great. So let's wrap this up and then we can get on to questions. So it's 2021 now, 40 years after its debut, and the SM7 is more popular than ever. Again, gamers, performers, podcasters, just everybody seems to have one now. But I got this quote from a radio guy just a few weeks ago and it says, I worked in radio for 36 years and the best microphone I ever used was a Shure SM7B. Nothing else is even close. So there you go, guys. That's the history of the SM7B and its uh, predecessor, the SM5. I'm going to stop sharing here at the moment. And uh, we can take questions or you can tell me to go away or whatever you want to do. Hey, Dave, can you talk about your uh, SM7 in front of you and, and what uh, serial number it is? Oh, hold on a second. He took the windscreen off so he looks like... <laughs> You missed yeah. that, huh? Yeah, I didn't. I didn't see it. But so, so look at the look at the mottled finish there, the lighter gray and then the darker gray. That was the finish that we used early on. I think by, we we stopped doing that sometime in the eighties. But if you see that, you know it's a really early mic. It's a stain. Yeah, that's a stain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah, seven. So I have two of them about the same age. Uh, but this, I think, I tracked this thing to about nineteen seventy six based on the serial number. We don't serial number. Uh, a lot of our products. Uh, and they've changed, and the serial number schemes have changed so many times, I can't keep track of them. So, right. That, that probably was just sequential for the sequential for this one, would be my guess. You know, so if that was, you know, if we brought it out in 73 and you got this from 76, you can see we didn't sell very many of them. Back right. Then, so, so um, you had started, you talked a little bit about Thriller, and I was just going to point out that uh, Bruce Swedean is a, major figure in Minneapolis recording. He came out of Universal down in Chicago, and uh, but worked here for many, many years. Uh, we just lost him, I think, last year. But he yep. was the guy that stuck Great. the SM7 on, on uh, Michael Jackson. And the, the other piece is, you know, we, we've seen it throughout the years. Anytime you saw bands playing uh, live in the studio, and that just has to do with the, uh, the pattern control. It is such a tight pattern that it gives the engineer very good control over uh, what leaks in and what doesn't. Yep. Great. Um, it's very, very uniform in all frequencies. That's really what it is. Yep. Hey, Dave Mitchell, did we answer your thoughts and questions about SM5 versus SM7? Uh, you were relating some stuff to me about uh, Minnesota Public Radio and the SM5s. Let's see if a hand goes up from him. 
there's still radio guys out there that just, you know, bring it back, bring it back. And we're just like, you know, it'd be 200 a year. We, we can't even get suppliers to respond to us for that. Yeah. You know? Well, as, as you were talking about, the biggest difference between back then and now is now we have all the gain that we want without noise from the preamps that we use. Yep. So you can work with the low sensitivity microphone and, you know, it's, it's not a big deal. But back then you really had to push a preamp to get an SM7 or a, an SM5 to light up the meter. Yeah. Gain, gain is relatively cheap. There's Dave. Total characteristic differences between the SM5 and the SM7. So in terms of frequency response and, and tone. I've, I've never done a side-by-side -side comparison of it. So I don't want to make up a, uh, an answer to that, but they are both Unidyne threes and Unidyne threes just have some characteristics in them that are going to be the same, no matter what the rising frequency response and so forth. So, uh, so uh, it, it, there would be the difference <clears throat> that you're spaced further from the cartridge in a five. So you would probably have yep. less um, proximity less, effect. Yep. That's correct. That's correct. Which is one of the differences between the 57 and the 58, essentially the same cartridge, but the right. ball, Put you yep. about an extra quarter of an yep. inch away from the, the grill. Yeah, I see. Minnesota Public Radio loved the SM five Bs. Yeah, they, they, they weren't alone. But you know, once you bought them, you didn't buy any more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they did work. They do work forever. It's true. <clears throat> they work forever, right? Like that. Seth uh, Scott, hello, Seth. Um, hey, truth to saying, old mics sound better. You know, here's here's what I say about that, right? I mean, you know, things age, right? You know, I mean, you get, you get stuff gets on the diaphragm, you know, and things happen like that. It, it's Old microphones can sound better. Old microphones can sound worse. There's, there's, there's nothing to say that one works better than the other or sounds better than the other. It's just kind I, of like old Telecasters, right? <laughs> I think some of that, you know, when you look at condenser microphones, there's a little bit more truth to, to that myth than there would be with dynamics. I can't imagine there'd be much change on dynamics from old to new. Yeah, I mean, you know, the magnets can lose a little uh, signal strength or field strength, uh, like that. And like I say, you know, stuff can get out of the diaphragm. These diaphragms are so lightweight, you know, you get enough moisture on there, enough dirt and things on there. And and maybe that starts to roll off the high end and you like that better. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> but you can't say it sounds better. I would just like to say, you know, they, they sound different maybe about that rather than better or worse. <clears throat> Nobody has indicated that either Michael or I are, are any better as we get older, just to <laughs> make that clear. All right. So I, I want to be educated here. Uh, number of SM7 during Twitch streaming. Okay. Go ahead. In, Go ahead in, Paul. In, in, Paul. Enlighten me. What is Twitch streaming? I know what streaming is, but what, what is Twitch? Like YouTube for gamers. Ah, okay. Yeah. We'll get a list for you. Yeah. Let us work on that, Paul. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just astonishing to me. I mean, that's an expensive microphone, but I mean, I guess, you know, gamers have money, I guess, right? <laughs> exactly. Used Probably more than musicians. Yeah, do. yeah, or me, exactly. Uh, and, and we mentioned before, this doesn't have to stay on SM7 topics, too. I'm, I'm the Sure Historian. If you have other questions about Sure stuff, uh, you want to know what, what Ken was like when he was working there? Uh <laughs> <laughs> oh god i was a kid we were both kids yeah we were both kids right. dave mitchell how many uh would you estimate how many studios were there set up with these things at npr in the day you need more cleaning as you get older <laughs> it's true at least says at least a dozen yeah yeah Dave, by the way, the Dave Mitchell guy is a friend of uh, Michael Solomon as well as Travis Ludwig from oh, yeah. the day, and Travis had made music with him. That's right. Do you have any Ken's performance reviews? No, he ne he never reported to me, uh, so uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't I don't know. We're both lucky. <laughs> it was it was a it was it was a very different place to work back then. I mean, it was it was it's always been great, but it was very very different. You know. What was it like? Was it? smaller was it oh god yes give and us you, give us the lowdown how many employees back then do you think there were company-wide versus uh how many employees currently work for sure well so, back back then we would have been like strung up if we if we told anybody but now today we can today there's around we're over 2500 uh, employees now um back when ken and i were there i don't know ken i wouldn't guess i would <laughs> There you go. Where was that at, man? Where, where were we playing? That was a ground round out by the Arlington Heights facility. 
Uh, that's right. Wow. <laughs> look, at, look at the size of those glasses. God, yes. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That is, that is you guys. That is us guys. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So the, the standard answer I used when I was out on the road and somebody asked me how many people work at Shore, I would always say about half of them. <laughs> was, thank you very much. Try the Beatle. I, I don't know. I, I really don't know what the number was. You know, it's. Um, they talk about it now. Yes. Right. Uh, now, you know, now it's over, it's over 2,500 and we have over 40 locations. Yeah. Uh, that was a big deal if you talked about it then. Yeah. Well, that was, that was, that was the sure's trying to keep privacy, you know, keep, keep private and, and probably also trying to keep people from, you know, kidnapping them or something. I mean, I, I don't even know, but you know, who knows? <laughs> so are there any other questions? Completely unrelated to SM7 or SM5 that can go any place you want with sure history. Yep. This is the guy who does it. Happy to. Would you, but can you talk about some of the coolest things that are in the, the physical archives? Because there's some awfully cool stuff yeah. there. Well, um, just for you know, we actually have an archive there. We have one of, how's the, uh, how's the MV7 doing in the market? Extremely well. Yeah, we're, we're, we're way, we're many, many times past what the forecast is going to be. So uh, the archive, we have one of every product that sure, at least one of every product sure has made. We don't have every last accessory, but every last major thing. Um, some of the coolest stuff in, we have all the Ben Bauer prototypes um, from the original Unidyne. Uh, we have his lab notebooks, which document all this in his handwriting. Um, we've got Sure's earliest RF product from 1933, which was a radio modulator that you took your carbon microphone and you plugged it into there and it turned the audio signal into an AM signal. So you would transmit to a local radio state or local radio set on a table. And that would be your small PA system. That's pretty cool. Um, we've got, uh, let's see, um, uh, a mic used by Jimi Hendrix. We've got a mic used by Roger Daltrey. Um, we've got a bunch of, uh, several gold microphones that were inscribed to different performers in the sixties and seventies, uh, were given out as gifts. I don't know if they gave them back or we just did, <laughs> did additional ones. Um, world war two mics. Uh, we have our all, uh, each one of our condenser mics that we made in the early 1930s. It goes on and on and on and on. Uh, it's, it's a way cool place to visit. Of course we're, we're closed now, but, uh, when we do reopen again, our archival visits can be organized. Um, it uh, takes a while to do that, but you, you know, you only see, it's like going to the, the field museum. You see like, you know, one half of 1% of what we actually have. Um, but there's about 30,000 photographs and hundred thousand documents as well as all the products. Is yeah. that in Niles or is that the one mm -hmm. in downtown yeah. Chicago? It's, it's in okay. Niles. Yep. It's in Niles. And it's, it's really useful. I mean, a lot of things, for example, if you look at our MV5, MV51 microphone, that's just like a, uh, you know, a recreation of our Model 51 from 1947. So on a regular basis, the design engineers come back to the archives and look at older products, 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, and take little design hints off them and then reuse them so that it keeps the family resemblance. With everyone having an HD 4K camera and the, the driving nuts at the mics on phones still seem to be the lowest bidder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, it does. It does, but I don't think that's going to change, you know. We're, we're doing a lot of video work, Seth, just promoting ourselves as the reps up here and promoting the brands. And we use the uh, Sure MV88 Plus video kit that attaches to your iPhone. And it's amazing how good the audio sounds on that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're using it, of course, because we should. We're trying to promote the, that particular product. But if you haven't played with one of those, they're awesome. Yeah, they're, they're, they're very cool. Yep. Yeah, it's interesting when a, when a new phone comes out, you know, whether it's a Android or a new iPhone coming out to product, you know, out to market, the the thing that they, the one thing that they don't talk about uh, is the the audio quality. How good is the microphone? You know, <laughs> you know the cameras and the speed and the uh, the apps and the and all this stuff, but never does like you know the microphone uh, quality conversation ever come up. In the AV business, we refer to that as small A, big V. <laughs> yeah, it's true. 
Certainly, it certainly is that way. But yeah, so the, you know, the archives is just. Uh, I mean, uh, I went back there. Oh, I guess when was, when was this about? Well, it was during COVID. So I, I go to the office and there's nobody there. You know, and and I decided just to every week go back and just grab a box off the shelf and just look inside there. So I grabbed one from the uh, Kennel Appreciators from the Gwen Patuchek collection. He knows who <laughs> Gwen Patuchek is. Was his boss? I worked for her, <clears throat> and. There was a lot of stuff in there that shouldn't really. We, I'm like, oh, we don't need this. We don't need this. And I was like, what's this? And it was a 16 millimeter roll of film in absolutely pristine condition that was shot in 1943 at the Sure plant showing how they made the T17 microphones. Wow. That was cool. So we had that transferred from 16 millimeter to digital. And it's got not only the this wonderful a documentation of how we built microphones during World War II, but the very last 20 seconds of it has the earliest moving footage of Mr. Schur that we have as well. So there's stuff, there's stuff in there that just, you know, it's been packed away. Um, just last week I was there and uh, looked at the document. We, we have about 500 boxes in offsite storage. Most of it's just like invoices and stuff we don't need. So slowly we're looking at these things. Nah, we don't need to keep this anymore but I got a box that had engineering drawings in it. They had original hand drawings of the Unidyne inside from 1939. I'd never seen those before. So that's awesome. That's, yeah, that's, that's it's really great to find that type of stuff. So yes, it's a cool job, you know, and I like that they pay me for it as well. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one up on us. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Other questions from anyone? You're so you're so polite up there. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ah, there's still members of the Sure family still active at Sure. <clears throat> That's a good question. So so you know now that Mr. Sure and Mrs. Sure are gone, I can give you an idea. Mr. Sure was married twice. Mr. Sure was married once around 1927 uh, to the first Mrs. Sure. They had two children, Bob and Myrna. Neither of them were ever involved in the business. Bob passed away two years ago. He was a uh, English teacher, a, a poet. Uh, he wrote song lyrics, just kind of like a, a bohemian, if you will. Uh, never was interested in the business. Never was associated with the business. Myrna is still alive. She's eighty-two. She is a retired uh, clinical psychologist, uh, specialist in child psychology. Uh, lives in Philadelphia. Actually, has some books. If you're interested in child psychology, look up the name Myrna Sure. Uh, she has some very famous books out about that. And she also was not interested in the business as well. So he knew that that was not going to be, the, that neither child was going to take over the business. The second Mrs. Schur, uh married her, Rose Schur, in 1954. That's the Mrs. Schur that most of us know. And then she ran the business from 1995 when Mr. Schur passed away to 2016 when Mrs. Schur passed away. At that time, then the, comp the ownership of the company was transferred to a trust. Uh, the trust is held by all the employees. And if you know anything about the uh, legal aspects, of, if you have a trust, the trust must have a beneficiary. And the beneficiary is philanthropic organizations. So basically, the easiest way to think about this is that Sure is a for-profit company run for the benefit of charities, which is pretty cool. That's but, super cool. I did not yeah. know that. Yeah. But there are no sure members of the family involved anymore, even though we all feel like family members to a certain extent. Anything else you want to go to? Kenny, you want to try to, you want to stump me with something? <laughs> no, I don't think I've ever been able to do that. Okay. Well, if, if I do get something, it usually sends me back to the archive to figure out, you know, something that, Hey, you, and then, and it'll turn into another tech tip down the road. <clears throat> so if anybody in here ever wants to be part of a group that goes and takes a look at this stuff after we're up and running again, it really is fascinating. It usually involves, you know, not handling the goods and yeah. the librarian comes out with the, with the gloves on to show you these pieces because they're all extremely delicate and they're ancient. Yeah. The, you know, it, it's, it's really, you know, there's sure products are not going to break, but it's really the aspect of the oils on your hand. I get down there and, you know, can cause problems with the finish because basically it'll be put back into the archive. Actually, the biggest problem we've had over the years is the foam 
the uh, rubber that we used to pack stuff into because some of that stuff, when you, you take this foam rubber and you put it into a plastic case and then the off gas, there was a whole series of microphones we made called the PE microphones. And we started looking in those about seven years ago and all this foam was turning into this goo. And we had to go through and look at every PE microphone in the archive, take them off, and then use acetone to, to clean off this awful, gooey mess that was from the foam rubber. <clears throat> so all those things now are, now, are no longer original. They, they, we've removed the foam rubber, and now they're just in those plastic uh, white lunch boxes that we used to make. <laughs> so there are all kinds of weird things that happen that have nothing that you just can't predict this stuff. So, But this foam goo is ugh, ah, awful. Well, okay. Um, I want to thank everybody who stopped by to spend some time with us today. Yeah, thank uh, you. And Michael is available to answer questions. If you need that, you can always contact one of us at Excellence Marketing and we can get it through to him. Um, he may step up here again someday, but it won't be in winter. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> That's Even right. I, no region roots. I got, I had 32 inches of snow in my backyard, so I'm, 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 <laughs> it's melting away now, finally. <laughs> but. But uh, yes, th thanks, thanks for the time. Again, you know, if uh, you can you reach me, if you want to reach me at Sure, easiest thing to do is just to info at Sure.com to the Sure Historian. It will get to me. But I'm happy to answer questions, and particularly when you run across old Sure products in Grandpa's attic or something like that. I'd like to know about it because every now and then it's something we need. And then, you know, we can work out some type of barter or something along those lines. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Hope you have a great weekend. Let us know if there's anything we can help you with. We'll talk to you later. Thanks, Ken. Thank Thanks, you, Michael. Guys.